fun, the freedom to interact in whatever way is comfortable were all excellent. Um, this was just part of some of our qualitative data. As for our discussion, this project demonstrates how community-focused research can truly make a difference. Um, our mobile sensory room supports neurodiverse students, including those with ADHD, ASD, or sensory processing disorder. It helps with self-regulation and emotional de-escalation, which can improve academic performance and provide a space for social events or sensory breaks. Um, as part of this broader project, we also created an infographic that highlights the benefits of sensory integration. This summer, we have expanded uh, the mobile with the mobile sensory kit to two more campuses as part of a professional development training on inclusive practices. Our goal is to enhance disability justice um, by creating a more inclusive environment for all students. Um, actually, not only students, but really also faculty, admin, and staff in higher ed, and to highlight the training needs um, for, for faculty. Some of the challenges we may encounter include finding an appropriate space, improper or ineffective use of sensory items, as well as the full integration of this space into campuses as an extension of student services. In summary, our mobile sensory space offers an effective and affordable solution for sensory needs uh, um, in higher education. And this is all we have for this part. Thank you for listening and we'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, do we have uh, questions from the audience? Mm -hmm. Let me skip, give folks the, the first shot at it. So um, if you... Excellent. Well, I'll, I'll get us um, uh, started. I really, um, it, it's an exciting piece and um, and being able to address the sensory integration needs of, uh, of students with, um, with autism in the educational setting is um, really a high lift, probably um, well, um, well timed. Uh, I guess one of the questions is for your, for the participants, um, what were the characteristics of them? I think they most were were autistic, but were they you really across the spectrum? Was it a neurodiverse group? Um, mm -hmm. uh, were there any representatives of of the um, you know of a a population that wouldn't be considered in the autism spectrum a range mm -hmm. area that with other IDD or you know even um, uh, uh, folks that are um, on the uh, on the, the higher functioning end of the neurodiversity spectrum, and you just kind of look at who, who participated. Right, yeah. So one of the limitations of this study was we could not collect um, characteristics of our participants. Um, we were not allowed at the time. Um, however, this conference was attended by a wide range of participants um, on, yes, on the spectrum, different types of special needs, um, including students and faculty, staff working with um, people with autism and so on. So there was a wide range. Um, unfortunately, we cannot break down um, based on characteristics. However, we did have, as we said, um, we did observations and we um, collected some qualitative data as well. Um, but there was not a sample big enough to talk to the differences or, yeah, to specifics when it comes to the spectrum in that sense. It is our hope now expanding to other campuses, having the IRB and permission to collect um, all this data to actually expand on, on the study and, and have a larger sample uh, that's always uh, a challenge. Thank you for asking. Other folks have questions for Monica and her team. Mm -hmm. I will come back with another one in a minute in case I'm, I'm loaded here today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Diogo. 
Hi, um, fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I had a question about what you anticipate some of the challenges with perhaps scaling this up might be. Yeah, um, we already encountered some of the challenges. I would say they were pretty minor at the time. Um, simply not having a monitor in the room uh, that proved essential. Also having staff that is very knowledgeable um, because we did have participants who spent the entire day in the sensory room and they enjoyed it so much. But at the same time, you know, um, there, there needed to be a little bit more guidance or attention, um, more maybe more individualized attention and so on. This is something we will need to really focus on moving forward because we cannot simply deliver the, the kit and say, okay, here you go. You can do whatever, right? I think the next step is to actually come with um, some guidelines, some examples, some proper training because uh, we need to ensure that there is a safe, use. Uh, we also experience folks taking some of the sensory smaller items with them, <laughs> uh, sometimes just not knowing that they start to stay in the room, uh, you know, or maybe they would feel sad. Uh, so that emotional factor that comes in. And so if staff are not properly uh, trained, there can be some miscommunication <laughs> and so yeah I think this has to be an important integral part moving forward yeah thank you for raising this so, Mecca I, an, another follow-up question you you clearly um you, you addressed it in in your in your poster but one of the things that you're going to run into we all run into is when administrators look at something like this, they're going to say, you know, how much does it cost? And, yeah. you know, the cost is reasonable for the room, but it's where do we put it? Um, what yeah. space is available and how do we allocate that space? Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the questions is, do you, you, you looked at um, awareness and, and recommendations for use, but did you consider or are you considering in future work evaluating whether the use of the sensory room actually improve some measures that would be important to administrators? Do you see improvements in attention? Do you see improvements mm -hmm. in some measures of, of, of academic uh, performance of completion of, of simple or complex kinds of tasks? Those are the kinds of things right. as an administrator, they, well, it's great that people got awareness, but what does it do for the educational effort? And I'm wondering what so, thoughts you've had around that. Yes, absolutely. Um, we've we've done some groundwork. Um, you know, getting familiar with the research out there. Obviously, there is a gap in understanding the connection, the impact, the long term impacts. It is difficult to evaluate. Um, however, we will be working with those campuses that will decide to host the sensory room for for the entire time, basically, right? Because some of them just want to test it out. Um, like you said, space can be an issue. In fact, many campuses decided that library is a good place um, to make it more inclusive. And so uh, moving forward with those who decide to host it um, for a longer duration time, or really establish it as a fundamental space that is being advertised to not only students with um, disabilities, but really anybody on campus, we can then have a, a, a more rigorous um, research approach to collecting this type of data. So yes, hopefully in the future, um, we can talk more about how it can impact the academic performance attendance. Sense of belonging we thought was very important, a uh, sense of community and so on. And thank you so much again for raising. Wonderful, we have a, we have a comment in the chat from, uh... Acacia Rosano, uh, it'd be great to have sensory rooms at all conferences in line with yeah. the question, what are the barriers to having sensory rooms outside of the, the constant one, which is cost? Mm -hmm. What are, what are yeah. other barriers? Uh, space, so the appropriate space, and also just the operational um, things like the logistics, right? As I mentioned, um, there needs to be a set, let's say, opening hours, staff that is trained, um, that can manage different types of issues that can emerge. 
um, just making sure that the equipment is up and running because it does include quite some um, electricity and uh, different types of um, power and, and so on. So um, I would say logistics is quite a, a hefty one in the back of it as well. So it's good to have tech support. Um, but yeah, with the space, normally a room without windows works perfectly fine because it is a dimmed light environment with some light installations. Uh, we had something like a nebula, aurora type of, you know, galaxy, uh, almost like a universe theme, really, when you walk into the room um, that people perceived very, very positively but you could really play with it. So on the other side, um, sensor integration allows a lot of freedom, a lot of playfulness and creativity. And um, I think we are all still learning from this experience. And as we um, kind of expand, we will have more FAQs to share. All right, I think we're close to time. Uh, you know, I'm looking to you to tell me yes or no. Yes, actually, um, and uh, one second. So that's actually a perfect place to move on um, for the next person. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I don't have a list of who's next. Uh, Danielle, do you? <laughs> I, I, I do. So why don't we go to... Uh, um, uh, Erica Nishiguchi and her team uh, on describing an inter interactive pilot project for group telehealth caregiver behavioral training in a developmental P uh, behavioral pediatrics clinic. And uh, so Erica, will you be presenting or someone else on your team? I believe that is the other room, um, but the folk, for the folks that are in this room, um, Diogo, I see that you're on camera. Um, Erica, if you're in this room, feel free to chat and let me know, but what I have is uh, Diogo, you could go next. Okay, wonderful. Diego, then go ahead. <laughs> if you'll introduce yourself and, and your team and where you're from. Yes, of course. Um... So my name is Diog Fort, and I am a doctoral student at Johns Hopkins University, as well as a former intern with the Maryland Center for Developmental Disabilities at Kennedy Krieger Institute. Um, so as a description of myself, um, I am a black man with black curly hair, and I am wearing a white shirt and blue suit jacket. Today, I'm going to briefly present on the pilot implementation of the Faith Community Learning Collaborative, which is an IDD-inclusive faith support ambassador program for faith leaders. While I am your main presenter today, Dr. Miriam Fonadu, who is my supervisor at the center and who is here with us on the call, um, designed and implemented this intervention, so none of this would be possible without her work. So we chose to do this intervention with um, faith communities because they can be very important in shaping an individual's environment and community. And they're also very important sources of social and moral support for individuals, families, and caregivers. Despite their importance, individuals with IDD and their families often feel excluded from faith-based spaces due to fear of judgment or stigma, um, but also due to a lack of sensory and behavioral accommodations. Services can be long, they can be loud, and that's often not a very comfortable environment for people with IDD. At the same time, faith leaders are a great group to work with since they have the power to shape attitudes of their congregations and denounce discrimination. What we find, however, when we do, we part of this work was based on a community needs assessment um, conducted by the MSADs is that even when they're motivated to create disability-inclusive religious spaces, many feel uncertain about how to go about it. So to address this, our center works to implement a collaborative learning and training initiative meant to give faith leaders the tools to promote IDD inclusion in the faith communities that they lead. 
So this program comes in a few different steps. So we start with a pre-training survey, which asks faith leaders to one, rate how inclusive they think their faith community is, and two, rate how prepared they feel to implement inclusive practices. Um, we then have a two-day training conducted by Dr. Fonadu um, based on a curriculum framework she developed called the Six Beasts to Inclusive Practice. And at the end of the training, we give them another survey asking about their preparedness, where we hope to see how much they've learned. Three months after, we survey them again um, for their preparedness. And at that point, participants are also invited to apply to receive um, $500 grants to be used to fund a small inclusion promoting project in their communities, and then asked to report on the success of those. For our first cohort of participants in this pilot um, phase, we recruited 13 leaders, um, 12 of which completed both their pre and post surveys. And of those 13, 10 were Christian and three Jewish. Um, 10 of the participants led communities of faith of at least 300 members, and four of them with over 2,000, so fairly big congregations, and all were from Maryland, with most coming from the Baltimore um, and DC metro areas. Okay. So this bar chart um, shows the responses for the questions about how inclusive um, the faith leaders describe their faith community as being. So on the leftmost, you have the question prompt, and then you have a series of three numbers. The leftmost number um, counts a proportion for both very, uh, strongly disagree and disagree, um, and nobody strongly disagrees. The middlemost number um, counts the neutral responses of not being sure, and then the rightmost, the two positive responses. So from these, we see that most participants describe their community's mission statements and general attitudes towards disability inclusion to be positive. But we really see gaps when it comes to written policies, guidelines, and accommodations in facilities and spaces, where leaders are much more uncertain about their inclusivity um, or that inclusivity is just rated as poor. Now, this chart compares the pre and post training survey responses to the question asking about the leader's own preparedness to improve inclusion in faith spaces. And here I want to highlight, sorry, I know it's a busy figure, but I want to highlight how the areas where we see the most impact of training is in assessing and implementing written policies and guidelines, as well as spaces and facilities, which were the two areas that our participants reported being weakest in their communities. So this shows that our training curriculum is filling a recognized gap in the toolkits of faith leaders to promote IDD inclusion within their faith-based spaces. In terms of community impact, given the size of each of their faith communities, some into hundreds and four even above 2,000 members, having faith leaders who can self-assess and enact inclusive practices carries benefits to potentially innumerable people with intellectual and or developmental disabilities. While we do see impact on self-reported attitudes and preparedness, an important limitation is that we don't currently measure actual changes in, for example, written guidelines. For now, we have no systematic way of tracking um, if those tangible changes are being made. However, as some leaders have chosen to participate in our mini grant funding program, we have some examples of the kinds of activities that faith communities can do at a small scale to welcome people with IDD. Um, so in the screen is a flyer um, for a Sensory Sunday event that one of our training participants and grant awardees put together and which implemented several accommodations that allowed people that hadn't been in that congregation for a long time to be able to participate fully. So these included, as you can see, noise canceling headphones, um, a calming room, fidget spinners, and a abbreviated um, worship service. Going forward, um, our biggest challenge is funding support really for this project um, to ensure that we can continue engaging with these communities, sustaining the trainings we do offer, which are all free of charge, and making sure that we reach a more diverse slice of faith traditions and regions of the, of the state. So these are our references, um, which I'll stop for just a couple seconds and then for the discussion question, I'm open to any questions or feedback. Um, 
but we did have a specific discussion question, um, which is one that we've been pondering internally quite a bit, particularly when talking about data collection needs and funding, which is how do you balance um, your data collection needs, which are often needed to show that your program works to funders uh, with ensuring that your community partners are not overburdened or more hesitant to participate at all. all right. So this is a question for the uh, breakout room, not one that you're ready to give an answer to or? <laughs> uh, no, this is a question for the breakout room. Yes. <laughs> okay, wonderful. All right, so discussion on this question, balancing data collection needs with, uh, with burden. See, maybe we can bring down the uh, the PowerPoint so we can see everybody's face. There we go. So that's a, that's a nice way of shifting the the load to the uh, to the room. So any any ideas for Diogo um, on? You know, how do you balance um, data collection needs with uh, the burden uh, for community partners, so particularly folks who are involved in community-based research? There are likely others in the room that are more experienced with this than I am. Um, but um, one thing that I'm thinking and that I'll do in some of the smaller projects that are more community based uh, is really making sure that as we're thinking about what some of these outcome measures and metrics are, um, making sure that uh, community partners are really included in that process. Um, I think that then there's more buy in, uh, but then also there's more opportunity to find things that are dual benefit, right? Um, that would be helpful for the researchers to know, but then also, um, you know, a benefit or beneficial conversation to occur for uh, the participants as well. I'm not sure if others probably have um, more things to add, but there's one thing I'll throw out there to get us started. Thank you. That is really helpful. Others to chime in. Well, this is this is an issue. It's not just for community participatory research. It's an issue in in every kind of research that involves a a human subject um, response. Um, and we and we get into it you, here. You, you're asking community partners to provide you know completion of questionnaires. During COVID, we were putting together a, a big grant to look at some um, uh, late effects of COVID and involved blood draws. And one of the things the IRB wanted to know was what was the volume of blood we were collecting from children at different ages, and was it safe? So this is this is a this is a universal research question, a, a really uh, a good one to uh, uh, to bring to the table, and and certainly community in, engaging. Um, uh, community partners in the design and selection of the measures um, is uh, is a good way to to do this. I guess one of the other questions that that I I pass back to you and your work with the with the uh, faith based leaders um, is were the questions that you were asking them, were, were they meaningful to, to the folks that are the participants? That's always the question we have in, uh, in community participatory work is that as scientists, we may ask questions that are important to us, but are those meaningful and important to the participants? And I don't know what, whether you had any, any comments on your interactions with your, your team on that one. Um, yeah, I can take a stab at it, and Dr. Fonadu, feel free to jump. And if I miss something, um, I think one of the feedback that we got um, from the questions was that they didn't even, a lot of the things we had asked about in terms of inclusion were not things that were on people's radars. Um, even thinking about, you know, is my space accommodating? Do I have written guidelines? And people just did 
not have an idea if they had those policies in place. Um, so I, I guess to answer your question, I think um, our, our items were not initially designed um, in direct partnership with the um, faith leaders, but they were based on previous work and on um, the community need survey that we had um, done previously. And so they were very geared towards the gaps that we identified in that community needs assessment, and I think were enlightening even to the participants. Um, Dr. Fonadou, if you have something to add. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you did a great job, Diego. Uh, just to add to that, so the training that we had developed um, came out of the needs assessment that Maryland, you said, did. Um, just kind of to get an idea. And the needs assessment went to not just the faith leaders, but also to community members, parents of children with disabilities, and self-advocates themselves. And from that, we were able to create this six-piece inclusive practice that guided our two-day training curriculum development on helping faith leaders kind of gain some practical skills on how to make their spaces a little bit more inclusive for families of children with disabilities. Um, that's what Diego did mention that this is really free offer to them is a two day training and they attend and receive materials. And one of the um, activities on their first day is a needs assessment of their own community. Um, that's what Diego is uh, pointing to that they were shocked that some of the things that we had asked because we broke it down for them. So the six piece really stands for person. And then practice is the second P, which is the micro level. So you are assessing your thoughts and feelings and ideas about people with disabilities. And then you move to other sets of questions that ask us about the behaviors and attitude towards people with disability. That's the second P, which is the practice. And that moves you into the next two sets of two Ps, which is the program and policies, uh, program and place, which the program is, is your programming, what you have, your events, are they inclusive enough? So there's some questions question that there was just a yes or no for them uh, to do this assessment. And then they have some question about place, which is the fourth P, and that's the meso level. And then we'll think about the structural barriers, environmental barriers that actually hinders people with disabilities from being um, effective participants in their spaces. And then we talk about policies and philosophies. Um, do you have policies in place that support inclusive practice? And what's your guiding principles that support inclusive practice? So then we are really shocked that they're not thinking about any of these. And we kind of broke it down for them that you don't have to feel overwhelmed as to creating and making your space a little inclusive. You can break this down and take one of the P's and just focus on that. Mm -hmm. And when we give that to them, we're not collecting that data back from them to analyze it and figure it out. Again, part of it is really building trust that this is not a quest of let's collect <laughs> or tell you that you're not doing great in your faith space because you've read it, everything they know. But this is really for you to be able to take that back to your community and then see where you can start to begin to make a difference. And we continue to help you and provide TA um, throughout the whole process uh, as you continue to build up your space. So hopefully Right. Thank, you, thank you so much. We, we, I got my notice. I have one minute and you hit it right on the nail. So we're going to do good on timing today. Uh, thank you for a, a really wonderful uh, a presentation and, and a great uh, engagement of the faith community in, in a meaningful way around autism and related disabilities. So thank you so much. Good job. All right, Dana, I, uh, I, I'm back on track. I had had made my list of all the people that I had coming in today, and I highlighted the wrong uh, the wrong uh, section a moment ago and read it right off. So I'm back on track, and uh, our next um, our, our next presenter uh, will be uh, Janelle Zhang uh, and Rebecca Hudak, um, who is doing our presentation here today. Janelle. Yeah. So uh, I will be presenting with my colleague, Julia, who is also here. So Dr. Rebecca Hudak, uh, who is the principal investigator of our study, um, she um, is not able to come here. Um, but uh, Julia and I will uh, be sharing some of our findings from the AMP project. So I'm just um, 
start sharing my screen in a bit. Okay, can we see the screen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so um, my name is Xin Yi Zhang, and I am a PhD student in the developmental psychology program at the University of Minnesota. Um, and I'm also a um, Minnesota Lynn Fellow. Um, so far, um, the appearance description, I'm an Asian female with long black hair and glasses, and I'm wearing a tan top. And Julia? Hi, everyone. I'm Julia. I'm a research assistant in the Autism Clinical Lab under Dr. Rebecca Hudak at the University of Minnesota. And for a physical description, I'm a white woman with brown hair and wearing a white shirt and white sweater. And... Um... Our topic um, today is a pilot randomized control trial of the Autism Mentorship Program. So autistic adolescents face a multitude of challenges that can significantly impact their transition outcomes, overall well-being, and relationship development. In this presentation, we want to present a community-based mentorship program for autistic youth by autistic adults um, that um, uh, could be a promising intervention uh, for autistic adolescents as they navigate um, uh, their transition to adulthood. So um, AMP, um, or the Autism Mentorship Program, was founded by Emily Goldberg, a mother of two autistic boys who realized that there is a need for more inclusive and tailored support options for autistic individuals as traditional therapy approaches may not fully meet their needs to connect with other individuals with similar autistic experience. So AMP matches autistic youth and adults in meaningful one-to-one -one mentor mentorship um, relationship. And it involves one hour weekly mentoring sessions in the evening after school. And the program provides flexibility and opportunity for individualized activities outside of school. Previous studies on the AMP show that mentees experience increased social connectedness within their mentoring relationships. They also found desirable changes in targeted outcomes from pre to post test assessments, as well as positive impacts of mentor relationships on various outcomes. So our research questions are, first, to what extent is AMP acceptable to those who participated? And second, to what extent does AMP show pr promise with the intended population? and I'll be going over our methods portion. So for our methods, our mentees, we first started out with a large sample. We had 24 participants and we chose people who were aged 14 to 18. And so from those 24 participants, we had 13 that were randomly assigned to AMP and 11 were not. And from there, our final sample for our mentors included 12 autistic adults who ranged from ages 23 to 39. And those 12 autistic mentees and mentors were then um, matched together. And so those mentor and mentee matches were essentially based on identified characteristics that are important to the individual, their interests and their characteristics and their experiences with autism, most importantly. And so our mentoring pairs met virtually via a web-based video platform. And then multi-informant data were then collected to determine feasibility of the study procedures, as well as outcomes for youth who participated in AMP as compared to those who did not. Finally, descriptive and inferential statistics were used for our data analysis. Um, so for results, um, our study, um, the AMP study was shown to be overwhelmingly feasible, acceptable, and satisfactory. So 100% of mentees and mentors were retained from the beginning um, to the end of the program. 
and um, implementation uh, went as planned, attendance was good, and the online format was rated by most as easy and enjoyable. And participants largely agreed that AMP participation was meaningful, useful, enjoyable, and a good source of support. And we observed the strongest effect of participation in AMP on youth satisfaction with self, um, self-esteem, perception of support from others outside of the family, um, as well as engagement. And as Jenny already had said, our main conclusion from this pilot study is that, you know, the participants found the program to be feasible, satisfactory, and beneficial. Um, mentors and youth reported quality mentoring relationships, and youth felt a sense of belonging in AMP. Wonderful. So, um, make your references. So thanks for a, a great presentation. So, uh, you know, mentoring is is becoming a, a very effective intervention across, you know, many, many different conditions. And uh, this is an exciting use of it. Uh, questions um, for either Jenny or <laughs> Julia? Well, I, I have mine loaded up, so I'll start with one for you. <laughs> one, of, one of the things about programs like this is that they tend to be um, uh, often supported by, you know, a, a short-term grant philanthropic, and then, you know, there is, uh, they're, they're really unique to the institution that has them. But if you were going to take this to scale, do you have a... Is there a standard curriculum of, of topics that would be covered in a, in a systematic fashion between the mentor and the mentee, uh, or is it completely individualized um, uh, as you as you move forward? And then, you know, for you know replication purposes, uh, how long does this go on? Is it a lifetime mentor? Or is it twelve weeks? How, how do you, how is that structured so that other folks who might want to replicate and and try something like that would would have a good idea. Yeah, so the program, this went on from January to June, um, so a couple month period. And so that was actually, this is what the great thing about the pilot study was, is we did get a lot of feedback. And so some feedback that we got is that they wish the program was longer so they could you know, form closer relationships and they could get more out of these mentoring sessions. And another feedback that we got is some people preferred more structured activities. So. Overall, a session, it was pretty open-ended. There might have been a couple of things that they go over in the beginning at the initial start of the sessions, but they weren't incredibly structured. And I think that was one of the feedback pieces that we got was that they wish there were more planned activities and things like that. Um, you know, so there's maybe not as many awkward pauses or uncomfortable moments and things like that. And so I think in the future, those are two things that we definitely want to implement. Yeah, like Julia mentioned, um, so the program usually run on uh, close to the school calendar. Um, however, at the end of the program, um, if um, the mentee and mentor uh, would like to share their personal contact information, then they're uh, welcome to continue uh, meeting just like um, on, on their own terms. Um, but that wouldn't be like the official mentorship um, that um, we are um, planning here. Um, and also uh, for the question of like the the, the structuring, uh, like Julia mentioned, uh, we have been receiving feedback of like wanting more structures, um, but at the beginning of each um, sessions, um, there will be kind of like a list of questions and activities um, that are provided as resources um, for mentees and mentors to choose from. Um, there are also some interactive games um, that um, they can play if they would rather to, um, to kind of engage in some games um, instead of like verbal talking. That stimulate any questions from our audience. All right. Well, I have another one, and this this is this is a, a little more uh, difficult. But when we look at mentoring problem uh, programs, um, there 
if not really carefully structured on the mentor side, there is a, a, a risk of harm if the mentor is not screened and trained. So did you have, what, how did you select your mentors uh, to make sure they were in and, and did you provide any, any training or if you're gonna do you know, part two, would you and what might that look like? Yeah, I can take this question. Um, yeah, so our mentor um, selection, um, so all of the mentors, um, they were um, as basically, um, they there's the application process uh, and they're, all the mentors also went through background checks um, so just to um, ensure like safety for all those who participate in our program. Um, yeah, and also um, the mentors receive ongoing mentorship supports. Um, so um, every month there will be like a, a, mentor, a mentoring the mentor session uh, where um, mentors and the uh, lead facilitator will communicate kind of like questions or um, experiences that they might have as mentors. Um, and also um, in our study, we um, also want to see whether this program help mentors to develop their leadership experience and their uh, connection with um, the autism community, as well as how they feel about their autistic identity. Uh, and we also observe positive changes from participating in this program for mentors. All right, thank you. Right, any other questions from our audience? I think we're just a couple of minutes under um, in terms of time, so there's time for one more. But uh, if not, I'd just like to say thank you to both of you for an excellent presentation. This is, uh, you know, th this really does map out well with um, with other uh, other kind of, uh, of programs, and um, you know we're. You know, we, we've seen this evolve in the intellectual and developmental disabilities world um, with things like Best Buddies and, and programs like that that have really gone national. And this, this is a, a, a really nicely focused program using that kind of model um, with um, uh, autistic um, individuals. So thank you for sharing it and your enthusiasm for it is uh, palpable. So thanks for that as well. Thank you so much. Good, thanks. All right, we'll move on to our uh, our final presentation. Um, and um, I think this is uh, uh, Jay Kyung Willows and, and team on effectiveness of stimulus control transfer procedures from English to home language on listener responding skills for transition age individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Oh, uh, Daniel, All I think title. Title. <laughs> again, actually it's uh, Kristen Rodovich, correct? Oh, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. I did it. I did it again in terms of mixing up my. Uh, my I'm sorry, and I read that great title. I was really eager, eager to hear the presentation. But yeah, okay, Kristen uh, Radinovich. And so this is uh, this was also kind of exciting. Mirror Me, the gamified VR for building SEL skills via mirroring and attunement. I'm sorry for mixing that one up, Kristen. Yeah. And Kristen, sorry for say, saying your last name wrong. That was not intentional either. <laughs> That's okay. I did have a, a brief moment of panic where I was like, am I in the wrong room? <laughs> so, oh, I'm in the great. wrong room. I hit the wrong, uh, hit, it, hit some some blocking on my screen to tell me who was doing it. I hit the wrong color. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. Get my heart rate going, right? So, um, hi, I'm Preston Rodonovich. Um, I am a pediatric neuropsychologist by training and the director of the WVU Neurodevelopmental Center. Um, today I'm presenting on a partnership with a private company called Vismu LLC. Uh, the CEO, Michael Stoffer, is my collaborator on this project, and unfortunately he was unable to join us today, so I will be presenting. Um, I am a middle-aged female with a chin-length hair. I'm wearing a brightly colored geometric shirt and glasses. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about um, a virtual reality based tool that we have been developing that combines music and movement in a fun therapeutic way to improve social engagement and interaction um, among students with autism spectrum disorder. 
So as we know, um, autism spectrum disorder is the most common neurodevelopmental disorder among children. And thus, most teachers in our school systems will have uh, children with ASD in their classrooms. So this is a very important um, topic for teachers, because even if they think they're not teaching kids with autism, they most definitely are. Um, so by definition, we know that children with ASD have problems with social communication skills, including both verbal and nonverbal aspects of it. So the verbal aspects of conversation skills, back and forth, um, pragmatics of language, and also the nonverbal aspects of social communication, including body posture, gestures, and facial expressions. Um, current study is not addressing the repetitive behaviors or restricted interests. So, uh, we do know that the Common Core Standards do have uh, criteria for educational needs um, that will affect our children with ASD. So what we are doing is um, taking an aspect of dance movement therapy that we have adapted into this technology. So we are specifically looking at the concept of mirroring. So mirroring is the act of uh, kind of imitating another person, but it's much more involved than just imitation. So the key processes in mirroring um, involve attunement and engagement. So um, yeah, by showing attunement and engagement to others, we can engage in imitating the shape, form, movement qualities, and feelings of another individual's actions. So we do have some research on the neurological underpinnings of mirroring. If you've heard about the neuron system, um, I have this slide here with a lot of studies if you want to go deeper into that. Um, I'm not going to do a comprehensive review of the mirror neuron system. Or just to say that there is some literature out there tying neurological underpinnings to these skills. And these networks um, have been shown to uh, function differently in our individuals with ASD. We've also got some research that shows that teaching mirroring strategies can improve social engagement. Um, and one uh, couple of studies in our lab showed this as well. So virtual reality or VR programs are emerging as an effective tool for all kinds of uh, intervention. One of the great things about VR is that these programs can be individualized and controlled. Uh, new skills can be taught in safe spaces um, for um, our students. And these interventions can be tailored toward the specific needs um, of each student. Also, there's research that shows that this kind of technology is um, accepted among uh, our students approximately 65 to 100% of the time. So thus, we sought to develop the Mirror Me program. Uh, the product concept was inspired by our other engaging VR game called Groove Catcher. Uh, so Mirror Me is a gamified therapeutic intervention that leads students through a process to improve mirroring and social emotional learning skills. It's designed by guiding the client or student through a scaffolded therapeutic process um, uh, through a virtual world using a rhythm game um, approach. So you'll see in a second, I'll show you a video where uh, players are uh, instructed to match movements and shapes in the game play. Uh, there's a scaffolded therapeutic practice so that things get more difficult as they go. And there's a lot of positive feedback incorporated into the program. So as the student catches the music or the movement um, appropriately, they get visual effects through sparkles and particles. There are auditory effects that they hear. And then the actual hand controllers have a vibration um, to reinforce their success. And it also helps to sustain attention and improve effort. So let's see if my video will show. Uh, video is worth a thousand words. Here me starts with gameplay that kids love. Let's take a look.
So uh, we received some funding through the U.S. Department of Education Small Business Innovation and Research Grant, or SBIR. Uh, through this, we were able to do um, to further develop um, the Mirror Me program and do a small pilot study showing uh, feasibility and usability in school systems in um, Philadelphia and Camden, New Jersey. So we enrolled eight special education providers and 17 middle school students diagnosed with ASD. We used some standardized measures to um, uh, score their usability and experience with the Mirror Me program. So here are some of our educators who have uh, donned our gear. Um, the providers were educators uh, Overall gave uh, good scores of usefulness and ease of use. They found it very easy to implement and uh, use. And the students also found it very enjoyable and engaging and said it was easy to use and would recommend it. So uh, now we are looking to expand this project and we'd love to get some feedback from you on next steps and how we might uh, go from here. Uh, thank you. you know, VR is certainly, and, and use of technology in the disability field uh, is really growing, uh, and the applications are great. So I appreciate the innovation uh, that you have there. What one of the questions that that I had for um, a um, a group of children um, with autism is. Did you run into any uh, adverse events? Um, did any of the children find it to be overwhelmingly stimulating, uh, an overload that, that it actually produced any kind of anxiety from, from using that? Or was it, and it looked like it was pretty much universally accepted, but you had a couple that didn't, didn't fall in there. I wonder if you'd seen any adverse events or had concerns about how, you, or ideas about how you might manage that if the child was, found it to be an overload. Hey, um, we are mindful of that. Um, we didn't have any major adverse um, events in terms of increased disruptive behavior. There were some that were just didn't want to engage. Um, and so we didn't push that particularly in this, this small study. Um, and, you know, there are also things that are not even related to autism spectrum disorder that are an issue. I myself am very easily uh, get motion sickness. Mm -hmm. So I have to limit my time in the headset, which I guess is ironic. Um, so there are issues like that. We uh, definitely want to rule out anyone with uh, seizure sensitivity um, until we can better understand that. Uh, so for this study, it was a one-time exposure, um, you know, certainly next steps, we want to do more of uh, um, an intervention approach, uh, you know, randomized controlled trial. And that's one of the things um, we need to think about. In another study that I'm doing using VR, we have, um, we actually have an orientation approach that we do first to uh, just show it, you know, does this child tolerate the, you know, just the wearing of the headset? Are they willing to engage with it? Uh, and if so, then we move on to the next stage. So we're not going to force this on anyone who. Okay, good. Other questions from other folks in the room?
Well, I'll pick up on your discussion questions a, a, a little bit as well. Um, you know, this is this is a, a, a technology um, uh, dependent kind of, of intervention, and and to take this something like this to scale, which is what SBIRs really want you to be able to do anyway. Um, what 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 is the what is your cost? Um, and what are the, the barriers to being able to, to bring in, not just the cost of the equipment, but also training, implementation, what would be necessary to have a therapist be able to, to use this, if you don't mind sharing that, that background information with us? Yeah, so right now, Mirror Me is not commercially available yet, so it's just in the prototype form. Um, we uh, anticipate at this point, um, it's about $950 all in. So that includes the, the headset and the devices and um, the software. And with that, they get unlimited access. We don't restrict access with that. So that's not a small amount. Um, one of the reasons we started in schools is we thought it would help with accessibility to a wider um, population. Um, in some particularly economically distressed um, areas. Um, so having the school, you know, providing it for the schools, of course, at this point, we we provided all the equipment. Um, but cost is certainly one thing. But, you know, with all technology, the cost for these kind of um, headsets are coming down um, every day. The training is really minimal. Um, you just have to learn how to navigate the, the setup um, you saw they had the control panels on the side. Um, depending on your comfort level with technology, that can take anywhere from 10, 15 minutes um, to maybe a little longer for someone who's and, you know, surprisingly, um, regardless of their functioning level, they're pretty savvy with technology and, and a lot of them kind of jumped on and figured it out faster than some of the providers. Anyone else have a question? Well, I do have one more, and that is generalization from the training session to real life. And what, what are your plans for being able to validate um, the, the impact or evaluate is probably better, the impact in, in, in children's um, interactions in, in real life social situations? Yeah, so first we even need to get to, to the intervention study. So this one was just a, a feasibility and usability. Um, so doing that randomized control um, trial um, with a comparison group to show, to implement it over time. So not just a one-time thing, but um, two to three times a week over the course of approximately three months is what we're thinking is gonna be the responsive dose. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we just found out we did not get funded for our phase two study. Um, so one of the issues is um, this, the number of ASD students we could access. Um, and so they wanted a much bigger trial. Um, so one of the things we're thinking about is so if there's anyone on who uh, might be interested in doing a multi-site collaboration, kind of it up that way, maybe looking at more of an uh, NIMH uh, funding route, get, you know, get it out of the school. I feel like just my comfort level, I work in an academic medical center, so I kind of know how this would look in a more outpatient ambulatory clinic setting. So. All right, good. Well, I, that, that was a, an excellent presentation and um, and actually very stimulating to, to think about the, the applications. So thank you for sharing that. And I apologize for my, my color coding here. I've really messed this up this afternoon. Brandon, thank you for keeping me on, on target. I just want to say thank you to everyone in the group for um, both your participation in the audience, but for everyone who presented. Uh, it was a really wonderful uh, afternoon to hear the, the things that are going on. So, um, Brendan, any uh, any final comments from the uh, operational side of the world? I think we're going to get bounced into the uh, out of the uh, um, our our breakout room and into the main session. Is that correct? 
Yes, we should be. I believe that we'll be taking a short break when we return uh, back in a few minutes. Um, at least that is what my current schedule um, is telling me. I haven't heard of updates otherwise, so it sounds like we're still doing a break. So um, we can leave I, the room now? Sorry? Leave the room now, but stay uh, online. Is that the plan? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do want to echo again. I loved hearing about the research that everyone's doing. So thank you so much for all of our presenters today, too. It's wonderful to hear about um, on this side of the world. Thank you, everyone. See you on the other side. <laughs>